Um, I'm quite excited to be here today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of anatomy, but also about the tools that we use now, and that we will be have a brief look at the future that we will be using. And you guys here, you're the fertile minds. If you want to be knowing about your bodies, or even if you want to be involved in the health profession, if you want to be a doctor, a surgeon, a physician, and paramedic, a nurse, an OT, or physio, an exercise scientist, you're at a great time in your lives because we're going to get to play with some cool toys, and you're going to get to learn so much more about the way your body works than previous generations did. Now, I teach clinical anatomy to predominantly medical students at Bond, um, but I'm also involved in a lot of other teaching. The history of anatomy is fairly um, long. I'm not going to spend too much time on it in my five minutes today, but from the Egyptians to the Greeks, the Italians, the Dutchmen, the Englishmen, and then there was body snatching, snatching Scotsmen, Burke and Hare murders. Initially, during Egyptian times, they would do the process of mummification. They would actually do a limited dissection. They would actually remove the organs of the body and they'd be stored in those canopic jars at the bottom and they'd be kept in a chest with the body. Now this was 1600 BC. Flash forward and the Greeks started learning a little bit more about the body. They knew where the organs were. Um, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, there was um, Empedocles. They all started to gain a little bit more knowledge. Nothing changed. They were still cutting the body. They were still performing dissections. Flash forward then to just after about 200 in um, the second century, Galen started to pronounce that the brain was the center of intelligence and his, basically his theories went unanswered or unchallenged because he was doing un un these under the auspices of the church to a certain extent. And then we get to starting medical schools. So this was sort of 15th, 16th century and things. The medical schools in Europe were starting to take hold. And this is a very early dissection. There was obviously no fridges about then, so the cadavers would go off, so you had to do things very quickly. So people would flock from all around, around Europe, they'd pack these theatres, there'd be little um, incense burning at the bottom so that the smell of the sort of decaying body wouldn't put you off and the people in the galleries wouldn't sort of vomit. But um, essentially it was a dissection, it was a full body cadaveric dissection. These were usually executed criminals, so it was quite a rare thing. This was a court physician that was doing this, so it was quite rare for there to be um, bodies available. And so there became an excess demand. It couldn't really, the supply of bodies couldn't meet this demand. And so people started stealing bodies. They started exhuming them from graves that were just freshly buried. They then led to the Burke and Hare murders in Edinburgh and Scotland where they would actually kill people so they could then sell them to the medical school. So it was quite a fruitful enterprise, but the Anatomy Act put an end to that. But this is 1600 BC, Egyptian times, to the 16th, 17th century. And we're still doing the same thing. We're still teaching using a cadaver. And we do still today. And I'm not advocating we get rid of that. But what we have now is a whole variety of different things to teach. So if you're interested in the human body, we've got anatomy art now. We've got some fabulous models we can use. We've got a little pin board at the bottom with some wires and some pipe cleaners. We're making a model of the brachial plexus. It's quite a complicated mesh, meshwork of nerves in the upper limb. The skull, we've got these beautiful pictures, exploded skulls, we can do all sorts of things with the graphics, but this is still just sort of touching the, touching the, sort of the, the beginnings of what we can now do. And the top right picture is the sort of early start of what we can now do with medical imaging and how we can now teach anatomy. The humble computer chip has opened up all these dimensions to us in the way we can do things. We can now take a body and you can perform a virtual dissection. You can put it through a CT or a functional MRI or an MRI scanner. You can do a virtual dissection or a virtual autopsy. Colonoscopies can now be done virtually. Okay? If you've potentially got a risk of colon cancer, you have to get a colonoscopy when you're getting onto middle age. Okay? You can get that done virtually now without the pain of a telescope up your bottom. And if there's anything there that might be worrying some, then you might have to go for the colonoscopy. But it will save an awful lot of the population the, the problems of having to go through that anesthetic and sedative. We can now use augmented reality, so we can meld computer-generated images. We can build up CT data sets and make them 3D. We can meld that with virtual life and real life. So we can look at a camera, and we can look at a computer screen, and you can have the deep structures of your body portrayed across the real person as they move. And so everything's becoming very immersive. Everything's becoming conceptual so that students can learn in three dimensions, because that's what the human body is. The top right there shows the laparoscopic techniques, so when you do keyhole surgery. So we can now use this to teach. It's no longer just for the clinicians out there. Okay? That middle one on the right there with the, the skull, that's a CT reconstruction of someone with a cranial injury. So we can now take slices of the body, computer generated, and we can build them all up again, and we can manipulate, and we can rotate, and we can look at them in more detail. We can add muscles and nerves and tendons. Okay? We know that when you interact, 
when you look in things in three dimensions, you picture in your mind's eye that object much, much better than when you look at it in a textbook. So it leads on from Jeff's talk about how we're gamifying and how we're making things more immersive and more conceptual. The bottom right is an example of augmented reality. Here we're looking at surface anatomy, but the computer is generating the pictures of the ankle bones and the, the muscles underneath. Now, a physician could use that as a guided biopsy if you've got a lump somewhere, but we can also use that with the medical students. We can teach them the surface anatomy structures, and they can look at them in, in, in depth. That iPad um, app at the bottom is actually the f one of the first medical apps in the iTunes store, and it was the first one to be given FDA approval. It could be used by radiologists to actually produce reports that are valid reports. They no longer need big workstations. They can be anywhere in the world. They're geographically freed from being in the hospital. That's got massive implications for third world countries and for healthcare, but it's got to get implications for education as well. We can now use these tools, these portable mobile devices, which are fairly ubiquitous now. They're really fast, the processors are really fast, and we can do some amazing things. The top is another couple of iPhone applications with Netter's Anatomy. So students are learning in different ways. They're freed from the classroom. This example here, this is using the Kinect, the Microsoft Kinect, and it's doing live motion tracking of that person. Now that's not necessarily his CT scan, but that could be a person's CT scan. And as he moves, that's displaying the bones of his thoracic cage. We could use that for muscles, we could look at his organs, you can do in as much depth as you wanted. That's gonna be the future. You guys are possibly gonna be interacting um, as either physicians or even as patients with your doctor wirelessly over video conferencing. You may well be able to have an app for your phone where you can scan it across your hand and using your CT information, it'll tell you where the problem is, where the lump is, where the bump is. There's a whole variety of things that's opening up. One of the things that um, I've done at Bond is that I've created with some of the colleagues in game design a, a, a very basic iPad app. This is something we did. This was only a couple of months' work. This wasn't that, that invasive. Um, basically, it allows the students to interact. It allows them to take the heart and the cardiovascular system and look at it in more detail. We can put in some imaging. You can see where the heart lies within the thoracic cage. You can scrub across, and it'll go light and dark. We can also look at CT scans, and we can scrub up and down the body in transverse slices, so they get a better picture of where they are. Apologies for my videography. You can see my ugly mug in the reflection. <laughs> so this is all basically taking these tools, and it's immersing the students in the experience, because we know that when you manipulate, when you use gestures, and when you actually interact with the material, which is three-dimensional, you learn so much more. And it makes it more fun as well, the whole experience being immersive. That was really it. The future is exciting. We've got all these new toys to play with. The fact that mobile phones are becoming so ubiquitous and so small and so portable opens up the horizons for healthcare. We can now have a mobile phone shaped, sized ultrasound. Okay? We can take that within the classroom and we can use it to enhance our anatomy teaching. We can see things in a deeper level. Okay? There will be, literally, I don't want to channel Steve Jobs too much, but if you've got a gallbladder that's sore, there will be an app for that. Thank you very much, guys.